everybody. Welcome to Tabletop Top. Tabletop Talk. That's a hard one to say. Uh, where GMs <laughs> and DMs alike get together and we pretend to know what we're doing. My name is Nimue and I will be hosting this talk tonight and uh, getting to talk with all of these awesome DMs and GMs about who they are and what they do, as well as taking questions from you guys. Um, so I guess to start us off, uh, I will ask y'all, um, how long have you been playing and how long have you been DMing, as well as your name? Um, so we'll start with Cap. I'm Cap. Uh, <laughs> I have been playing for a, a, a little under two years, DMing for a little less than that. Since been playing since June of 2022 and DMing since August of 2022. Awesome. Uh, Eric? How's it going, everybody? Uh, yeah, so my name is Eric Wahlberg, and I've been playing a little bit more than two years. Uh, I started playing in 1977, and uh, pretty much a forever DM up until COVID, and then I was been playing a lot of games uh, online, Twitch, um, with some of the folks here. Some of the awesome folks here, and uh, also on Gen Con and some other places. Uh, I think that's all the questions. Some just answer. Awesome, uh, JB. Yeah, so uh, I'm JB Jubaka. Uh, let's see. I've been playing since. Got to make me think. Back when I was in college, so that was 2006. Yeah, so that's a good. Oh crap! Is that really really been eighteen years already? Um, <laughs> close to. Uh, wow, good crazy to think about. I've, although I've been DMing for far less than that, uh, I started DMing in twenty. Well, actually, mm, wait, never mind. Not not quite that much less than that. God, Ava, do you remember when I started that Apocalypse World game? Was that back in like twenty nine? Uh, I think that's been going that, on since 2019. 2019. Or yeah, 2019. So, yeah, three years there. Four years. Five years. Five. <laughs> Five. I can do math. Awesome. It's uh, not like we play a game that involves a lot of math or anything. <laughs> yeah, nah, nah. It's not like DD was created to teach people how to do math well. Um. Hi, I'm. Lore, Lore Moth. Uh, I have been playing since mid 90s. Um, started with MacWarrior Battletech, um, st the Star Wars D6 game, a long, long time ago. Really? Way too long ago. Um, probably younger than I should have started, yeah, but uh, it nice hasn't helped my math skills, so it's not that good for it. It is a tripod. Oh, all right. Awesome. Nerdy? That's it. I'm Tiffany, uh, also nerdy teacher, and I started playing in 2016 and started DMing about six months later. Oh, she teaches middle school. Oh, nice. Uh, mad respect. There's another teacher. <laughs> awesome. And Eva? Um, I think I've been playing for the money. Oh, wait. <laughs> I wish. Oh, wait. Um, they don't get... I got bit by the bug back in college too, so probably 2016, so eight years now? Yeah, eight years. Sweet. And I guess I'll say I've been playing for about six or seven years, and I have never DM'd. <laughs> Your time will come. Yeah. It's time. Can I just say that I feel like I was a witch that was awoken by adventurers that I'm playing this game for so long. <laughs> you guys are like, oh, nine years, which is great, which is a lot. Even two years is plenty, but I, I'm like, I feel ancient. Don't worry, we won't know until near the end of, or the end of your story arc that we, uh, how big of a mistake it was to wake you up. <laughs> no, I'm finally you... not the oldest member of the group, though. <laughs> I'm always the oldest member of the group now. <laughs> Ever I After 10,000 years gives you such a crick in the neck. <laughs> what? 
All right, so it looks like we have a few questions coming in here. Awesome. Um, let's see cool. here. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, what is your number one priority topic to cover on a session zero? Mm. Ooh. It depends on the game. I have two off the top of my head. I can go ahead and start, and if anyone wants to add to it, go for it. Um, the My first priority is uh, the safety of the group. Um, hard yeah. nose, soft nose, and things like that. Uh, and if anyone watching has no idea what that means, it means things that would make the players uncomfortable or would be a, quote, trigger for them. Um, for example, something as drastic as um, a child coming under harm. Uh, that might be something that a player could not handle. That would be a hard no. If it's a soft no, then it might be something like they are okay if it happens off screen, but they don't want it to be permanent. They want to be able to fix the problem. So that's something that you really need to discuss and you may have to have individual conversations with people, but there's a bunch of PDFs out there that you can download for session zeros to go over anything that might be like that. Um, and then the second thing is, what is everyone's expectations of the game? And I heard somebody say, well, it depends on the game. Exactly. What kind of game do you want? Do you want one that's role play heavy, combat heavy? Do you want a sandbox? Do you want railroad? Whoever wants a railroad, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> are you wanting this to be collaborative or do you want to, I don't know. It's just what do your players want out of the game? They want their backstory in there and whatnot. You need to discuss that at session zero. So everyone's happy. I'm a big fan of, of the all system. of the above there. Um, for sure. Yeah. Some of the other things that I'll do is I'll go through and just so we're not all meeting in a bar. Uh, once all of the above has been established, I use the, the rest of the period for things like establishing character relationships between the different characters, um, figuring out who knows whom, how they've known each other. Um, it's really good for kind of getting a good feel for the, the players so that I don't know, it helps them warm up a little bit into the world that they're about to step into. I agree. I would say those are probably near Yeah, the they're top not. On I mine. mean my mm -hmm. personal top priority as a DM trying to set up the story because the others absolutely I always try and fit those in, but the top priority for me on session 0 is always um through the process through those processes while i'm doing that i'm also trying to gauge based on the players i've invited to my table what kind of story i want to tell mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that's already been said. And um, if you're looking for systems that have a lot of the stuff kind of built in, um, you already heard me mention Apocalypse World. That's a system that already talks about character relations right from the mm -hmm. get-go. Part of why I love all the Powered by Apocalypse stuff uh, is because they, they they bake that in. The characters have to talk to each, have to ask each other, the players have to ask each other questions from the perspective of their character. Um, to solidify those relationships. And especially when talking about um, safety with the group, uh, another Powered by Apocalypse game, Thirsty Sword Lesbians, takes care of a lot of the stuff right from the jump. Um, all the stuff that that, uh, that Nerdy was talking about, Nerdy Teacher was talking about with um, what a hard nose, soft nose, it really details that out very well. So if you're a new DM mm -hmm. or you just want a good resource, uh, for how to ask a lot of those kinds of questions. Thirsty Lords, Thirsty Sword Lesbians is a really good system for that. All that stuff is free PDFs. Oh yeah, definitely. I've, I've done, I think, about three or four uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games now at this point, and they have had an indelible mark on the way that I run and the way that I play. So. Yep. Yep. It's great. My favorite system so far. Okay. Cap, did you go yet? 
I didn't. I have a 14 year old talking. I completely 100% disagree with everything everyone has said. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you um, would. I didn't go yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're like, I actually do this. Over here. Session zero? I don't use that. <laughs> Well, see, that's the fun thing, right? The only campaign... Of, well, okay, so I've DM'd uh, for adults a mini campaign, and I, the, the one that I've done for the kids didn't have a session zero. Like, the, the first session was just like, oh, I'm just going to do a one-shot. And uh, so there wasn't a session zero. And I learned the importance of a session zero by not having one. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, we ran into essentially the... Uh, um, convergence of different expectations where you know certain players wanted to play certain types of games and those they so they were essentially playing different games in the same session which caused issues and uh sort of unfortunately then had to work those out on the fly but yeah yeah like my first campaign was definitely a lot different than my second campaign and it, the first campaign they wanted to have more I don't want to just say more fun, but they wanted, you know, more hilarity. They wanted more off the wall things. And with my second campaign, it's a lot of character trauma. <laughs> um, they really wanted the backstories to hurt. So it's been very different. That sounds familiar. You got to get the, the full yeah. breadth of the human experience there. It's the first six episodes of the anime are, are for the zaniness. And then the rest of the other 20 episodes are for the pain. <laughs> well put all right Anything else guys it should be interesting a lot of the things that i will be discussing will co might come from a different place but end up in the same place that you are right um mm -hmm. in that back in the day i would generally have an idea of how i want to entertain and um kind of captivate the players so i would think of like oh okay maybe in my head for example uh, if we're using like hero system if anyone knows of that system which was uh mm -hmm. champions fantasy hero other things and um i might say ah you know what i have an idea where i want to have people make their characters and they can pick from anything in the book which means they could be a um a, ro a, a robot detective or they could be a barbarian uh in you know in conanisk type world or they could be a, a gangster character or something whatever but I would talk to each one of them individually. Uh, and I would say, hey, what do you think about making your character not knowing anything about everyone else's character, playing the system, uh, and, then, and then if they're cool with that, that basic premise, then cool, then I can start to work towards that uh, session one. And then the session zero stuff has to do with like safety and all that. I would always play people I knew. And so I would definitely know kind of the pain points for people. And if people didn't know each other, introduce and make sure that we're all on the same page of respect and enjoyment. And then I have things like, you know, I expect you guys to show up on time. I expect you guys to know that we're all um, mm -hmm. here to have a good time. And so people should not be abrasive to each other. Don't have my, my character, you know, tries to do so and so to the other character. Um, and, but then ultimately, it, it ends up in the same place you guys were saying, right? Which is that everybody felt safe, everybody agrees with the system. And then I can kind of present the story to them because they've already agreed upon it and if at the beginning they say no no i want to have a character that knows this other character or i don't want to play in this kind of uh system then we'll talk about it and i'll move it around i'll move the target until everyone's on the same page so that's my session zeros are kind of different that way well i think actually you brought us something eric that we should have been talking about earlier which is scheduling um and for, for session zero, that working out a lot of uh, communication about, okay, um, when, if emergencies come up, appropriate time frames, or like, or, or just if you need to drop out because of, of, of X, Y, or Z, um, just say, all right, I, uh, to, to really establish those, those lines of communication so that everyone can enjoy and have fun and come to the table and be ready to play each whatever designated time period it is um, so that i th i think that's crucial because i mean I i'm sure people here know the meme of oh yeah your what what kills your party calendars <laughs> yep perfect and I, I don't know how many of you guys played because a lot of you guys are like two years ago and stuff but when you play in person almost every group has yeah. that guy, 
or that gal or that person is always that, is that one person always lawyer. late. You know? Oh yeah. Or, or oh, the, that sorry, too. person's always late. And and yeah, they, I guess you have all the archetypes. Um, but talking about schedule, yeah. there's always that one person. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'll call me ahead of time. Uh, you'll be here. You'll be here in a couple hours, right? You know. So we have one who's always late, but she always brings the snacks. So we kind of. I was going to ask if there's a snack bringer. Awesome. Anybody See, else have anything else to add to that, that before we move on to the next question? For scheduling on my end, I, I try to, uh, I know that there are groups that uh, reschedule the game at the end of their session, like, okay, when's the next time we can meet up? And that works for uh, for some groups, although, you know, you, I've heard horror stories of like, when's the next time we can meet up? Two months from now. Um, but for me... My scheduling system for it has always been get everyone to tell me when they're most likely to show up. And then even if we don't ha hit critical mass to uh, to steal a term that I've he heard you use, uh, JB, even if we don't hit yeah. critical mass for the night, beautiful thing is we're playing. I, I haven't had a real world game, you know, there in like even before even before COVID, I have not had a real world game in ages. Most of my groups are online. My go-to is usually we are meeting this time every week at the, on this day every week. Even if we are not playing D and D, we are playing something. <laughs> yeah, that is nice to do in the, on the online age. It makes it I have found a lot easier, and I haven't had that many any problem players that don't show up on time or anything like that because it builds that habit where they don't need like it's the same every week it is a routine i have yeah. two groups um running at the moment and yeah the, the one of them every saturday um even if it's not my game um it's somebody's game that's going and it's always the same group of people every saturday 9 p.m we're meeting up on discord together and and getting <laughs> together for something and if enough people drop out, then that something is, I don't know, probably Jackbox or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I guess next question that I have that is from me, um, kind of going off of that question, um, is what is your favorite way to force players to interact in a session zero? Hmm. Like, how do you get things going? Point of clarification. <laughs> with each other or with the world? With each other. Okay. Like, how do you get them to start role-playing with each other and building those those bonds? I I love putting the group in instant peril because they're immediately engaged with, like, let's survive and, oh, it looks like you're on my side. Let's Let's figure this out. And you get this great dynamic of, Here's what my character can do, and here's what, how my character acts, and now I'm going to save you and show that I have some courage in my character, and now I'm going to hide over here and show you that my character's, you know, a, a coward. Um, so I love to create instant peril. That's fair. I think that is rest is a great <laughs> idea. I have a twofold for it. I never force them to interact with each other, but I like to set out the groundwork for it through uh duress yes but going back to session zero i have a standard of at your character creation at session zero you know someone else in the group they might not know you but you know them how hmm. do you know them how did you hmm. come across this person in the past did you were they part of the military okay if they were maybe they visited your town once and walked through and like they were your inspiration for why you left town and became an adventurer it there's some connection there already established i don't like having the group uh already know each other because i find that unless you have a group of players that has been playing together for a long time and already has a dynamic that actually can inhibit their interactions because they're stumbling over it and being very awkward and trying to figure out how they fit into each other. But 
having that one connection between someone else, I've had some good success with that. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, I like I've it. I've done that before, and I encourage players to be like, if you want to have a cohesive backstory with somebody, uh, whether good or bad, you know, let's talk it out at session zero or prior. Uh, we typically like make a like a chat or a discord and uh, that way everyone has access to everyone and talk to them. Uh, and that has worked out great. The My newest campaign was definitely insert peril here in the first few minutes. Um, my first campaign, they, uh, I've talked about this before, they all wanted to be uh, a traveling rock band in Faerun. Um, so they had to know each other prior. Uh, and I was a brand new baby DM, so I'm not sure I handled it well, but at least we were friends and we all knew each other. So they were able to latch on and start the role play. If I was to do something like that now, I might begin with something similar to, uh, you're, you start and you are playing your set. You're you know on stage and you're playing your set and it, describe your character, player one, and what are you playing and how do you do that? And then for player two, I might say, you are playing this instrument, correct? Okay, how do you add to what they're doing and stand out at the same time? So try to get them to, to describe how they're being cohesive in the setting. That's really cool. You're contributing I've to- I've always the, wanted them. Yeah, you're contributing to the, to, to the mood, to, the, to everything that's happening yeah. and mm -hmm. explaining how your, your character is enhancing it. Yeah, it's cool. I like it. I just always wanted to play a 5e game where it's a party of bards who are adventuring to pay off their college debt. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Oops, all bards, let's go. Ouch. That hits a little too close to home. Come on. You can't just be bards. You also have to have the wizard paying off their PhD. Uh-huh. I, mean, I guess that could work too, but I mean, yeah, it's just... I, talk about you know forming cohesion like that is a way to form cohesion is is, is just a little and little things like that you play for fantasy don't bring reality into it come on <laughs> the, 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 the wizard pretending to be a bard and nobody else knows i, I know that was a joke yes it is a good point is that that is another good way to have player interaction is to have them all uh have the same goal even if mm -hmm. it's not necessarily directly connected to one another. So like, if they're mm -hmm. all aiming for the same thing, regardless of whether everyone else accomplishes it, that's actually a good mm -hmm. method, at least of keeping and, group cohesion. Yeah, and Nerdy Teacher actually, and teacher actually brought up, uh, Nerdy, how do you want me to address you? Uh, sorry. Um, you actually brought up something, another, and something else important for session zero is, do we want this to be, how much realism do we want in, mm. are you okay with in this campaign? Do you like, uh, I heard you just say, I, I hear for the fantasy, I'm here to escape, I'm here to escape. Don't bring so much realism into this right now. And like, okay, that's important for me to know as a DM, I'll make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, again, Thirsty Sword Lesbians actually lays this out clearly too. Yeah, that's definitely a session zero kind of thing. Eric? Uh, you know, another, oh, go ahead. Someone was about to talk. No, 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 I was saying Eric. <laughs> Oh, correct. So um, another trick I like to use, and I, I think, you know, having done it so many times over the years, uh, is I really enjoy starting out two or three people at a time and then having going up to the other group and then they start to know each other. And then those, so you have two groups meet. Yeah. And then, then what happens is the dynamic because a lot more interesting because it's not just like, oh, should I say something? It's like, oh, somebody from my group said something, they said something, and I feel like I have to respond to represent my group. You know, I don't mm -hmm. trust this person, or are, are you the guy that so-and-so? And so it's really cool, because you, you kind of sit back and watch this really cool banter as they express their character types and their, their goals and stuff. I, I found that there's a lot of almost automatic engagement that happens, as well as bonding for the two or three people that know each other already. So that's another, you know, kind of almost like you're watching a movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Sudden typing. <laughs> All right. Um, so another question. This one's actually uh, from JLo Fett. So uh, they were 
uh, one of the guests on the last uh, DM talk show, um, he would like to know, uh, do you handle session zero differently for someone that you don't have a pre-existing relationship with as opposed to family or friends? Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of head nods. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely I don't even do a lot zero. more on lines and veils and various safety techniques for those. Mm -hmm. That's fair. I mean, yeah, when, as Cap said, when we did our second campaign together for um, the same group of people, we didn't have a session zero. Our session zero was us in a chat plotting our characters together. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I think because we knew the DM and we knew what we were expecting we survived mm -hmm. Curse of Strahd together. How worse could it get? Uh, it got worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we knew that. We knew how it was going to operate because we knew the DM. If mm -hmm. I was preparing something for family and friends, it would really depend on if I've played with them before. Because there's a difference between knowing your best friend and knowing how they're going to react to a, you know, a campaign. So mm -hmm. I think the answer is yes, but also no. <laughs> I'm I, was, I, I was gonna say I, I feel like a session zero for people you know but have not played with is at least as important as people that you don't know because mm -hmm. I feel like you can go into like if you've got family and friends who you've not played with you can go into a, a campaign with certain assumptions that turn out to be wrong based on what you know about this person as a person right. that don't map over to them as a player mm -hmm. I'm actually going to say the other side on it. No, I have, I run, uh, I run session zero the same, regardless of whether I know everyone there or not. Now, mm. to be fair, to be fair, I have not ran the same exact group more than once there's always either someone new or it's a different combination of people that i've played with before however session zero is as much for the dm to feel out the table as it is for the players to feel out the table so unless you are playing a campaign or unless you are setting up a new campaign for a group that has already played together with no additions or changes you still have to go through every single step. That is important. Every because yeah, every table is going to be different. Yeah. Even if they know each other well, sometimes because people change. Yeah. yeah, I think once if I've already established kind of my group and our style of play and our um, kind of unwritten and written rules of how we interact with each other. I would usually expect the person to kind of bend to us, but what I mean by that is I explain to them how we play, what the theme is, you know, everything from lethality to uh, the type of theme that we were using in this system, and just think, make sure they're cool with it. And if they have, you know, a good, you know, thing they want to bring up that I should go, okay, yeah, I can make that adjustment. That's no problem. Um, I'll do that. Uh, but sometimes people don't aren't necessarily the best fit. And, you know, if it's not life or death, if it's just people coming over to play at the table, I say, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. You know, let's have your character come in. It's, you know, everyone's super cool. We'd love to ha play with you and to see how it goes, you know. So, um, again, it's that same thing I mentioned earlier. I come from a different place to come to the same place, which is that we're all on the same page. We agree, and everyone, you know, would, like, use the terminology, feel safe. Um, but I would expect them to kind of fit with us and not the whole group have to make a big adjustment. Um, Although over time, you could, you know what, so and so doesn't like that so much. Maybe we should start to kind of shift it a little bit. Um, those things certainly evolve over time. Awesome. Thank you guys. Um, so, change of pace a little bit, moving away from session zero questions. Um, what is your favorite homebrew mechanic to use? Hmm. <laughs> oh, Eva's got one. Eva looks very excited to answer this question. Yeah. <laughs> I have a very simple, super simple homebrew mechanic that I like using. I can't take credit for it. I found it, but it is a solution 
to the issue of uh, players wanting to upgrade their gear, but either not having the money to do so uh, or not having anything they want. And uh, it is a little homebrew chart that I found online called Piecemeal Armor. The idea is you do not buy a full set of armor. Instead, you add to it as, a, as you go. It, the cost comes out the same, but uh, say you have a player that has scale mail and they, they want to play a really tanky character, but you've only been feeding them out piecemeal money because that's the campaign you're in. They might not be able to, to afford oh. that 500 gold plate mail suit. However, they might be able to, to shell out 50 gold to at least get the heavy pauldrons and put that on top of their level, leather gambeson that they've got. And that'll give them an extra AC here. And then they'll get the the greaves later and that, that'll give them an extra AC there and so on until they finally put everything together and they have their half plate or their full plate at the end. And it's a good way to give them something to not just something to work to, but also a steady progression where they are seeing their character advance as time goes on, rather than, all right, I haven't bought anything from any of the towns we've gone shopping in for the last year of game time. I can finally afford my plate mail. And they buy the one item and they're like, all right, dude, I've changed the one number, I'm done. <laughs> Fair. Uh, that's brilliant. I mean, you think about, I like Nowadays, it. like 5e, for example, every time you level up, it gives you a feeling of progression. There's always some new feature or mm -hmm. whatever that, that happens. But in general, also, as you gain, as you mentioned, you know, gold and you're adventuring to be able to, outside of leveling up, to, to kind of level up. So that's really, really cool. Then. I'm going to steal that, too. Yeah. I'm we'll also imagining, like... The, I'll send a link to it in the video chat. Yeah, please do. I'm, I'm also just imagining, you know, someone who's like, all right, I finally got the shoulder plates. Come on, hit me in the shoulder. Hit me right here, right here, right here. <laughs> I, uh, now that, my, that favorite is mechanic, uh, my favorite mechanic is um, rolling. D so, okay, this is, I play obviously tons of 5e, you know, but uh, I used yeah. to, when I run, really up until before the pandemic, I would play, I would run 1e usually, and uh, they don't really have skill checks, right? So I would use the D6 check system. So basically, since you basically will have from a three to 18 in a characteristic, um, for something that's like an even challenge or, or a decent challenge, you'd roll three D6 against it and try to roll under, right? So if you have like a 16 strength and you have to you know, force something uh, of the lid of something that's not something already in the game as a check, three D6 against it. Or if it's super easy, it'll be two D6, just to make sure you don't screw up. Uh, and then uh, and then 46 if it's tough and something incredibly difficult 5d6 all these can go against any characteristic you have right intelligence wisdom um charisma mm -hmm. uh that was really quick and easy for me i like that hey, i have a I've, um... stupid one. Oh, go ahead please please no no please i, I that go ahead oh, please don't oh, okay this one's this one's weird and embarrassing um don't know how it came up, but in my last campaign, somebody asked about, okay, this character is playing the typical bard and is, you know, with a new person every night. So eventually, halfway through the campaign, somebody asked, how many people has he gotten pregnant? So we came up with a way to figure that out. And I don't know if this exists anywhere else, but we did research and we came up with a if you don't use protection roll a d100 and a 24 or lower means pregnancy if you use protection then it has to be a one because you know adult products say 99 percent effective on the back um how long his mouth is open right now <laughs> this led to some interesting situations where players roll for fun and then they got a one and uh, now they're pregnant and um, I talked to them after and I'm like do you actually want this to happen to your character because we don't have to it's just a fun rule and they said I kind of want to see where this goes okay um, but 
Oh crap, I was gonna add one more thing. Um, we had to discuss whether or not prestidigitation counts as birth control. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think of everything you just said in the context of my games and my players, and I'm just increasingly oh. gaining more horror because uh -huh. oh, my games are either all horror themed or turn into comedy, and I can't decide which is worse the players putting a bunch of children into a world that's ending, or the inevitability of them trying to become Genghis Khan single handedly creating the next generation. I thought we were just discussing not putting real life into our video or into our role playing game. <laughs> That's fair. Thing. Uh, from Dungeons and yeah. Dragons to from Dungeons and Dragons to um, prophylactics and procreation. <laughs> oh no! For the record, I accept prestidigitation. <laughs> it, it 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 was a little weird when. Uh, character had to go up to the wizard and ask, hey, can you hit me with press digitation? <laughs> that mm, it's, oh, you know oh, there's a man. well you know there's apothecaries that that specialize. <laughs> but there's a potion for sure. <laughs> yeah actually that would make more sense to talk to an alchemist. Yeah. That's why you bring that's why you get an alchemist artificer on your team because they can do they can make one potion mm -hmm. per day. Oh my god. Actually, now, no, man, you need, to, you, need, you need to druid it for this. You need to druid it. Mm -hmm. Because the druid will be able to scout out it. the proper herbs. <laughs> There's a brothel next to an alchemist. They've set up shop there. <laughs> I've just Artificial you gotta just know your the ultimate condom. I've just had an awful campaign idea built off of that, Nerdy. <laughs> oh no. For, for, former adventurer group. They've already rolled the dice in session zero. They know how many kids they have. They're tracking. They, they received a, pros a prophecy. Their child is the chosen one that will save the world. Now figure out which child. <laughs> yep. I feel like this is the next OSR game. Yep. Every time you kill on the character, you... one of your offspring, just... Yep. As, as, the kids an aside, the as an aside in one of the um, adventures, uh, campaigns I was running, um, this friend of mine, she played a very um, uh, thirsty uh, male dwarf, uh, and she had this great Scottish accent, and she was, like, always trying to, you know, get laid. And so I said, okay, well, you've always been like this, right? She goes, yeah, okay. And her dwarf's, you know, 100 and something years old, whatever they are at that point. So constantly, I would have these characters come up and go, Dad? Like that. And so she always <laughs> would bump into people who were like, do you know oh you're my father but you know and so that was a running gag for you know a couple of years that i ran the campaign is dad yeah. that's great that's oh great. man someone please I, tell uh... their homebrew rule they do or nimway give us another question get us off this i have been working on a homebrew rule to make saber suck spells not suck and the idea Ooh. is that on a saber suck if you save the uh the, the villain whoever is saving actually takes a degree of psychic damage because they have to exert some sort of effort to avoid the real effects of the spell and if it's if it's a creature with a legendary resistance they it counts as a crit they take max psychic damage like they take additional psychic damage because they're not only avoiding the effect they're exerting an, a, a large amount of energy to do so I like that. Interesting. That's cool. Have to you know, it's, it's also cool mechanically if you happen to have a game that you think, well, this might be a really long battle. And so mm -hmm. now you have, instead of people just resisting things left and right, they're getting mm -hmm. chipped down. You know, think of like, I don't know how many of you guys played Street Fighter or a lot of fighting games. You'll yeah, hit them like a fireball about. and they block, they still take a little damage. Right, um, but that, that's that's brilliant though. That's I really like that. But no, I love the idea of damage over that here way. still trying to recover psychically from the previous topics. <laughs> I'm trying to help. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, there's nothing I can say that's going to to beat our our prestidig prophylactic <laughs> prophylactation. What? Prophylactation. Oh <laughs> no, see that sounds milky. Ew. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, is there a prophylactic version of casting shield? Oh, oh no. no. 
Uh, no. Uh, is that cast it, on the man that, that, or the woman? It, it, I mean, it, it, who says it has to? Yes. Why are you bringing? Ge why? Both why? Are, why gender it? Uh -huh. Both. On, why gender this? <laughs> I have to say, J Lo Fett said that the apothecary next to the brothel is named predetermined parentage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I freaking love it. Yes, absolutely. Well, for those of you who who've been watching the the roll for Kate game, um, there is a, an item that one of the characters has that I believe has shield and axe in that way. So definitely That's keep an eye out for, for that one because it's something. <laughs> sure, sounds it. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I've been playing. I've, I've, I've been writing mostly powered by apocalypse stuff, as you can probably tell. But I noticed that like there's there, there's no just like we talked about for one e um one uh, there's there's no skill checks. So I was like, well, screw this. I know uh, generally streaking what the individual stats can do. Give me all right. Um, roll roll a stat. And then using the same because power by apocalypse what it does um, because they try to reduce the math is uh, six or lower is um, is a miss essentially uh, seven to nine is partial is a success but at a cost usually and ten plus is great six great great success um, mm -hmm. and so using that I've been able to really have uh, characters dig down deep with like with like, with you notice this. Um, or uh, especially because weird is a thing in that game, and there's like you know this. Uh, well, actually, I, I homebrewed a little bit what the um, what the maelstrom is. Yeah, Ava's like because uh, Ava's character is well, yeah, has, is very maelstrom heavy. Um, he's like you feel a tingling in the back of your mind because of this, uh, and he's like, ah, oh, crap, what now? What is what what does this want for me? You you went the the extra mile and had the 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 super crit be like okay cool you opened your brain now you get to talk to the dm I, yeah now you talk to god um because well, actually uh apocalypse world um the first if you look at the first edition it gives rules for uh what happens when you um when you advance moves which so then if you roll 12 plus something extra special happens and essentially we're just like have fun and i went all right well i know what to do for that then <laughs> talk with talk with God. <laughs> it's wonderful with storytelling that you weave into that mechanic. You know, um, if you're trying to like jump over a pit and you do the like barely made it thing, whatever your you know your categories, you can describe how they're mm -hmm. hanging by their fingernails or something. They just barely make it. You know, um, that's that's cool because mm -hmm. you you're doing two things at once. You're not just saying make yeah. it or don't, but now you're also opening up a story within that action. That's Brilliant. Yeah, well, that, that's what Power to Pie Apocalypse really encourages is that everything is going to lead to, is, is going to help further the storytelling, especially with succeed at a cost. Um, one of the reasons why I love the system so much, it's so storytelling, storytelling heavy. Um, and that allows for a lot of creativity with the players and with the MC. That, cause that's how they're, they're listed in that game is the MC. Um, so it's it, yeah it's it's really fun and actually and i try to bring that in when i, I mean there'll, there'll come a time that i'm sure that i'm gonna dm um a D, D game i don't know if i can handle dming shadow run um after being in a shadow run game for a number of years but uh i i think that is something cool to bring into is to have to see whatever action that they're gonna for the storytelling the most find ways to weave it in <clears throat> We also homebrewed a, a introspection checks, didn't we, Nimue? <laughs> yep, we did. Ooh, introspection yeah. check. Ooh. Oh, that's yeah. handy. Care to explain, Cat? I like that. Purely, yeah, yeah purely, more. purely an R an RP mechanic. So it's it's literally a mechanic for therapy. Um, so the two characters that we're playing, um, one of them has telepathic ability, and so they're able to connect mentally and when the one character is dealing with very traumatic, she has PTSD. So when she's dealing with very traumatic um, memories, there's, you know, there's, there's an uh, there's conversation, there's RP. And then as she's calming down, 
she rolls a d20 plus her insight plus her charisma. And essentially she is using the force of her own will to pull the pain, emotional pain, out of her mind and separate it from herself so that it's not cutting her up from the inside. So it's externalizing it. Um, which is interesting with these two characters yeah. in particular because the character who's teaching her has a zero insight and a zero charisma. So his roles, he had to roll the DC or higher. She has a plus four insight and a plus two charisma, which means she has a plus six to her role. So she's actually 45% more capable of this, of learning this than he is. Um, but yeah, it's the, wow. it's literally a therapy mechanic. The idea of taking, because it's, it's not getting rid of the pain because you can't get rid of it, but you can take the jagged thing out of you and put it somewhere safe. Huh. Hmm. Cause you got me thinking like, is there, with each success, like is is there a is there a separate little stat that you have or like a counter that you have set up for how much psychic pain they're in from their trauma and that each subsequent uh, introspection they're able to like tick that down a little bit. Right. Yeah. Th and that that's one way it could be set up. Like a certain number of them. We're working yeah. out the number where. What's that? Well, I was gonna say there. So something that Cap and I haven't talked about, but I've talked with Dustin, is um, she's going to have a certain number of successes, um, which has not been determined yet. I actually still need to talk with him about that. But there's going to be a certain number of successes that will lead to her being able to unlock an ability that she has not previously been able to grasp in her mind because it's just so chaotic that she doesn't know she has the ability to do this yet so there is something that is going to happen there's, like there's a reward that is going to happen for mm -hmm. the successes um yeah i was wondering about that too that that's cool mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i thought of one last uh homebrew mechanic that <laughs> technically we all use to some extent but it's never an official one um, oh and that is uh, fluctuating enemy health. That is the... Yes. Ne you, you have your stat block. You're never really using it exactly as, as it is because your goal is to tell a good story. Your goal is to make sure people are having fun. If they are, if, if they are enjoying fighting the big bad dragon in the distance and you think it's getting a little bit too close to being dead, but they've still got another half hour in the, in the session tack on another 50 to 100 health if if they are close to dead but you don't want to tell the type of story where they're failing right now or if they do fail it shouldn't be right here you come up with some reason something that happens where the enemy is mm -hmm. either routed or distracted or has to take care of something else or so on and so forth or even better wants to make a bargain Yes. Ooh. Yes. Some those are the I found best. Don't doing wanna this. kill the. Don't want to fill yeah. out those death saving throws. They want. Yeah. They have it's another fun. goal. Yeah, it, no, it, it's really cool when you have the ability. And, it, and um, I'm, I'm sorry. What, uh, what's your? Hold on, I'd look on Twitch. <laughs> you can call uh, me JB. You, you are no, actually, a uh, Eva unit. Eva unit. Pronounce Eva. Ev Eva unit. Um, Eva you can unit. call me unit. You can call me unit. Okay. Yeah. So unit <laughs> is. Um, when you can do that uh, ahead of time, that I think is even like even better because it gives you the chance to be really creative. So I, I did have a situation where I said, oh, well, they're gonna meet this villain who is supposed to be a tough fight and they're supposed to either, um, you know, do well enough that he disengages or they see they're gonna be overwhelmed and they have this opportunity to flee. I, I kind of put in front of them. But if they stick around or things go haywire, uh, I said, this character would say, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to torment you first, you know? And so he basically, you're going to remember me, you know, and that on next time. So I already had a plan. It didn't happen, but I, and it's a storyline that flows nicely. So when you can work it out like that, I, yeah, I love that. So that's a, that's a good thing you brought up. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
Uh, well, we do have quite a few more questions, but right now we're going to take a quick 10 minute break. That way people can get some water, go to the bathroom, get some food, whatever they need, stretch legs. Um, and then we will come back and answer some more of the questions that people have submitted to us. So thank you for everything so far, guys. <laughs>
All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope everyone had a good, good break. Um, <laughs> I was kind of poking through some of the questions that people have sent in, and uh, the first one that I'd like to start off with is, what is your favorite thing or encounter that you have surprised your players with? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, God, I'm trying to think, because just, mm -hmm. just, oh, man, that's a hard one. There are a lot of fun moments. I might need your help with some of this, Ava, because you've actually played in one of my, in, in my game. <laughs> um, so I'm a fan of, I, I, I'm, I'm not afraid to say that I've definitely pulled stuff from other settings that I like. Um, I'm a fan of Discworld. Um, if, if folks, you know about Terry Pratchett. I know what you're about so to say. So yeah, Ava's like, Ava, 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 yeah, exactly. Um, so at one point, um, I had my character, uh, my players in, the, in this Apocalypse World game, because again, you know, remember this is Apocalypse Desert World. Think, think, it, this it's it's more diesel punk than Mad anything Max. else. Think Mad Max. If you want to know what I mean by diesel punk. Um, and so... My, my players found a library deep hidden under the sand. Um, and, and so they dug down, they got access to this library. And when they went inside, they started hearing, um, well, those who were aware enough to, to think it, to listen to it, they started hearing whispering sounds and those whispering sounds were coming from the books that were on the shelves they then met a very strange looking creature extraordinarily hairy long arms that did not look human that kind of and walked on more on all fours as it funked its way across the floor and it met them and all it said to them was Ook. But they knew exactly that they could just know what they were saying because they are the librarian. Um, so this should all sound familiar for people who have read Discworld um, as the librarian, as the orangutan. Uh, but what also happened out of this um, at a different library was that uh, uh, a li another li uh, different librarian who was more humanoid was bound to the library itself. The players attempted to rescue the librarian, bringing them out of the library. The librarian said, no, don't do that. Um, as uh, this unwieldy force, um, which as my players found out later on, is actually a multiversal, multi-universal force um, co was coming out. Uh, and because I accidentally had this librarian say a name, it spawned a totally different big bad that I hadn't planned on, one that eats universes. Um, yeah. So uh, I think that those series of encounters um, are really up there for me. I had an answer and then it left me. Crap, awesome. I got distracted. <laughs> I, I'll be honest. Not the encounter I thought you were going to bring up. I thought you were going to talk about the people. Oh, the people. But, but yeah, the people are there. My favorite encounter that I have ran was unfortunately uh, traumatic for my players. But <laughs> honestly, with the games I run, those are also the most impactful moments because I tend to have my campaigns be a bit more uh, grim, dark, and personal and that is why i don't stream them <laughs> um i had established earlier in the campaign um 
uh, core fears or uh, core like core things to that character, uh, things that defined a character's choices going forward and that no amount of therapy would truly change even if they did cope with it um uh like for instance um i we had one character whose uh, greatest fear was uh discovering that he is insignificant in an uncaring universe like it that is the kind of thing that you can get over it but you're not getting rid of it. It is always going to be there for on some level. I, I took all of these elements and I shoved them into a, a little abandoned cult house in the middle of Mithril Hall, uh, abandoned, and they needed to, uh, the party needed to go there to rescue another player who had been replaced by someone else earlier in the campaign without them knowing. And there was this spell ritual going on where this imposter was trying to uh, take over this player's character's body permanently and make it theirs. And they... Th they needed to interrupt this ritual. I put the exact amount of uh, interruption points or MacGuffins in this house as there were players that were managing it, and I split them up, and I had them each go their own way, and they each got their own personal encounter. <clears throat> but there was no... There was no succeeding the encounters... I designed them to be more story-based than anything else, and they were going to come out the other side successful, but changed. Uh, so, some physically, some mentally. Um, for one character, uh, they, uh, they went in and had to relive one of their uh, most defining moments of their life, uh, uh, dedicating themselves to their gods, to their god, acquiring their power. They had this whole backstory, and I talked to them in, in, in before the session, and I got consent for all of it. They went through the entire process again, and something went wrong with the ritual. And at the end of their encounter, coming out the other side, instead of that, it, their actual memory got changed. Uh, instead of them uh, going through the ritual, they now believe that they had to wrestle their powers from their god and that they were rejected by them. <laughs> um, that Golrick? That was Golrick, yeah. Yeah. Um, for another character in that, um, they were a fresh amnesia case, a adult who has no memory of anything and still kind of a child and learning how to live in the world. I had them suffer a loss of innocence, of uh, recovering some of their memories of their past life just enough to think that all the fears that they have in this current one are because of failures they had in their previous one. Uh, and that that set them off on this whole journey of figuring out how they, who they used to be and why that thing happened and also changed the way they interacted with the party. Um, the last character that I want to talk about in that encounter uh, was the one that got kidnapped. Um, throughout all of it, they're doing these roles and trying to see how they're coming out and trying to figure out, okay, am I going to come out this successful? Their character was trapped on the line halfway between life and death, where they were sort of a, a, a Day of the Dead themed skull candy paintings everywhere, cursed to be not really dead, not really alive, and they really wanted to be separated from that dead half and be alive again. Uh, I gave them their, their wish, 
we talked about this before the session as well. The ritual has two parts. The first part was already successful. Their soul had been separated from their body. They came out the other side, uh, regaining control of their body in the form of no longer being a living creature, but a living item. They now have the ability to possess other people's bodies, uh, but only if they're put on and worn. Fascinating. Huh. Uh, huh. I have one, but does anyone else want to go first? I mean, that, that okay. made me think not as something that I did as a storyteller or a GM, but as something I did as a player. A friend really wanted me to participate in their Monster of the Week game, and I just was not feeling it at the time. So I said, okay, the only condition I'm going to do this is if you let it turn out to be that as like a, I don't know, a mid-season reveal or something, I was the bad guy the whole time. And she mm. turns around and says, shit, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. Like, oh, fuck, I didn't think that was actually going to work. <laughs> so I ended up making this, this, I wasn't even subtle about it either. Like, it was, it, she was an evil wizard who was going to take over, you know, the greater Bay Area. Um, and had been around for a long time. It came up several times in the story that she was under observation from, you know, other secret society of wizards for trying shit before but the other players were like oh yeah no no this is this is our kooky aunt we love her she's great um and then it turned out oh no she's evil and everyone just was so betrayed and i was like i wasn't even trying that hard to trick you guys um <laughs> but they were just so oh god they were so mad at me so i one of my friends didn't talk to me for a week <laughs> Oh, it felt so oh, good. Oh, man. <laughs> Those always feel so good, though. Mm -hmm. when, you can yeah. just, when you can just get that moment where no one suspects anything and you're able to pull mm -hmm. it off, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. I Those accidentally, are the ones that people talk about. I derailed oh, the game. Yeah. Um, we had one more session after that, and nobody could recover. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you got any good ones? Yeah, so um, I have one where I accidentally caused trauma, although it was completely out of the realm of doing things that are safe. It was just a traumatic thing. So I'll tell you what happened was that I was doing a homebrew version of Ravenloft, and the um, players were in Barovia, and they were about to set off towards the castle, and they were gaining access to um, the hag, this, these, those hags that were going to give them that bread. Uh, but in my uh, homebrew version, they said, hey, this bread will boost you powerfully for a day, but uh, there will be some side effects. It will give you terrible nightmares, et cetera, right? They all agreed, this all or nothing, let's do it. So they all bought the bread and they ate it. Again, this is a homebrew version. I, I described that night while they're at the inn, how they have these, you know, kind of very uh, traumatic and um, unsettling dreams, and they don't really sleep that well, and that kind of go go about each of the players a little bit, tell them that, okay, you wake up next morning, you're exhausted, but you feel energized. They're all temporarily up a level, right? And so um, on their way there, they're going through a forest and they meet uh, this character and I'll make a long story short. They meet a character that basically says, hey, I'm also on my way to take out Strahd. I will help you, I know a way in. And they spoke to the person at, at enough length that they felt they trust this person and there's like, seven of them and there was one NPC. So, okay, cool. So they go and they have to um, spend one uh, one evening uh, camping in these uh, kind of ruins of a, of a home before they go up. And that night, I they have their, their, they're posting their watch and I describe, oh, by the way, this is first edition, right? So um, death comes pretty quickly and players know that. And so it's it's not as if you say, oh, we'll, we'll be okay, you know, healing word or whatever. So when, when when death is coming, it's dangerous. And so I described how that one, the, the, the thirsty dwarf wakes up. Uh, you were supposed to be guarding, but you fell asleep. You wake up and you hear this <coughs> And that they saw that the player is, is repeatedly knifing the wizard and the wizard's already at negative hit points. 
and then out through the forest come all these um, creatures to show that, oh, this person's obviously working with Strahd, right? And we do several rounds of combat, and they're following, boom, boom, they're, this person's dead, that person's bleeding out. The, the one person who plays a dwarf, this uh, uh, girl I was playing with, she was sobbing because she thought, this is it, we're all going to die. And I realized that I had to stop. So all of a sudden, <coughs> boom, you guys all wake up. So the bread was a communal uh, kind of um, dream uh, bread. And so they all were living a dream together, a nightmare together. And they woke up in the inn, and none of that actually happened. Uh, mm -hmm. So the entire encounter seemed like a real encounter. We played it, and the, the one girl yeah. was crying. I was, oh, I pulled him out of it quicker because mm -hmm. I didn't want to kill them all before she... So yeah, so that was my setup. Mm. Right? Like the whole thing was a dream. Wow, it was a communal, a communal dream. So, right. <laughs> you did that, and it was all a dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they, yeah. they didn't believe me at first. They said, "Oh, you just said that because you don't want to kill us." Like no, and then they, "Oh yeah, okay, actually, you did set that up, didn't you?" Yeah. Mm. I think you'd have a really hard time convincing anyone it was all a dream. It was intended the whole time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, I gave them clues. News I gave them clues. Oh, go ahead. Oh, mm -hmm. they wake up with scratches and bruises. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I gave them clues. Mm. They were traveling, had these a, a few weird things that would happen that didn't make sense, but they kind of just brushed it off. And so I, mm -hmm. I gave them these little clues, almost like if they like the Matrix or something, or like, oh, wait, that's weird. Why did that happen? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that was mine. Nice. Nerdy, you said that you had one? So uh, I'll be quick. The. Um, the one that I really enjoyed was one of the first ones I used to really get a player who happened to be my husband. Um, but uh, the chat was talking about different various forms of uh, mimics. Um, I used mm. a wizard's tower, you know, lots of traps and whatnot inside that they were trying to get through. They walk into a circular room with a staircase in the middle and all around the room are portraits, but the portraits are expertly made paintings of the um, the party's exploits, things that they've done and things mm. that they did that day. So mm. they're all intrigued, they're curious. One of them was of my husband's character leaping off of the ship that he's on to take down a water elemental in the shape of a dragon. So mm. of course his character wants to immediately go over and pick it up to take it home and all of the portraits are mimics so that Amazing. was that was fun oh boy i got some really cool oh, I love it. uh but i think if you are a dm and you want to throw something at your players and just let them be their character throw in a carnival have them go to a circus or a festival mm -hmm. or a carnival and let them play random carnival games you know uh there's many out there that uh, i found online um i've made some myself one i made was players had to walk a plank over like an aquarium of water and the audience got to buy fruits and vegetables to throw at them extra mm -hmm. cost they were rotten and <laughs> the player had to do deck saves versus the players who were trying to hit them and you know, it mm. was it was a ton of fun, and then they would get winnings if they got through it. And I had a D100 list of just random, mm. somewhat useful trinkets, like a candle that would never burn up, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, a, a solar angel feather that allows the player to know uh, celestial. It's something something simple. Mm. Uh, let your characters... Minor, your minor wondrous items? Hmm? Sorry? Minor wondrous items. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let your players just have fun, you know, as their characters. And that really helps get the role play going too if you do it early in a campaign. Mm -hmm. That's that's, that's great. Cool. I mean it it's it's I like a party, it. right? Like you're literally like the players are having a party where mm -hmm. like people mm -hmm. are having a party. They're engaged. That's really cool. I, I'll make I'll make this really quick because it's not really the answer. But um, there was a game. Uh, you guys are familiar with Dragon Magazine. It was out for many years. Um, it's a supplement for uh, Dungeon Dragons, and they often have these little games. Uh, the, that one of them is called Food Fight, 
And it was literally just like you're at high school and you're throwing food at each other and had like all these rules for like aerodynamics of certain types of food and how much of a mess it makes. Mm -hmm. and if you dump, dump an entire garbage can on people. And all, they're all rules. And so wow. I told one of the players, I said, hey, I said, you know, we're going to have some fun this, this one. Um, we're going to be a big feast. They just they just kind of won. It's kind of like the, the um, oh, Jesus Christ, what's the word? Uh, after the... After not the Game prequel, but what is it? Game After you finish, like this. Game of all. The epilogue. Epilogue. Thank you. Epilogue. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I said, I said, what your character is the Newmond. most boisterous again is that dwarf. I said, why don't you start a food fight? I'm gonna have rules for it. And so she literally role played. She boom, and then I brought out the rules, and all the players are just throwing food at each other, and it was just chaos. It was super fun. Um, yeah. so I'll pull back because I already answered two, but I thought it was really fun to mention was Food Fight. It, you can look it up. It's it's all my PDF. Um, it'd be in a Dragon magazine. Mm. I'm not going to be short at all. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the the encounter actually this goes back to also a a homebrew mechanic that I completely forgot. Uh, the first game that I ever DM'd live was a one on one shot for Nimue, and. Uh, oh. So I, I created a one shot for one player for one character, and it was a haunted cabin. Mm -hmm. And so I created a mechanic for this uh, haunted cabin in which it has six rooms. And uh, every time she opened a door, she would roll a D6 to determine what room that door opened into. Um, yep. And I would roll a D6 because the, the thing she was trying to get to uh, was in the basement but the, the hatch to the basement moved every time she opened a door. So she would roll a D6 to determine what room she opened into, and I would roll a D6 to determine what room the hatch was in. And when we rolled the same number, the room she went into had the hatch. Well, at one point, she was in the dining room, which was a three. And for three consecutive rolls, she rolled a three. So she kept opening the door into the same room and having this bizarre spatial loop and every mm -hmm. time she would go through a door, she would potentially take psychic damage. So the dining room was just beating her up. <laughs> the worst, she was finally, oh, eventually then able to find the, uh, she had a 16% chance of finding the hatch and eventually did find the hatch. But uh, yeah, the, the one-on-one -on -one shot. Beautiful. Yeah, that was great. Mm. Very cool. All right. Has everybody had a chance, I think, to answer the last question? I want to say yes. I think so. Can I also say that I'm sad that my Wi-Fi died when Unit uh, was telling me this story because I only caught the last part, so I was completely confused. So maybe I'll ask him later about what that was. I would be happy to retell it. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, Pupper well, Cam. Um, kind of going off some of the vibes from this last question, who's talking about how different players handle different things, uh, J-Lo also asked, um, how do you handle a situation where a player may be displaying an uneasy or trauma response during an RP or storytelling moment? Tell them it's a drink. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. Sorry. It's a drink. I... It's I something that I think has become a lot easier in the Discord era of role-playing, um, because it offers you an avenue to be able to reach out to them in the moment, but also in private and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't say that I've had any successful encounters in real life. Um, I say in real life, I in meet space. Uh, where this has been going on um, but being able to pull someone aside uh, in you know be it just sending them a private message or you know saying hey guys real quick I need to you know just do something and then pulling them into another voice chat that's something about the modern era of, of internet baseball play that I think is kind of an advantage mm -hmm. I agree, I agree with that. Yeah. I think yeah. when I've had, and I have actually ran into that both in person and online a couple times, um, 
usually has nothing to do with the actual game, but it doesn't matter if it does or not. Um, typically, the way I handle it is the same. I find some... It, to preface it, I never play with people that I don't already know, or at least I haven't had the chance to, um, for the most part, when I'm running them. I already know the person. I already think of them as friends. So when I say, hey, guys, uh, let's take a break for a minute, and I'll pull someone off to the side, there's, they understand. Um, but... Yes, talking to them in the background, finding out if they're okay, uh, if they need to take a break, taking it. Because I mean, it, at the end of the day, we all know we all know in the in the books what rule zero is, but there is a different rule zero, and it is the rule zero of the internet and of uh, having and of this uh, role playing in general, and that's uh, real life comes first. The story, the story is important, but real life comes first. You take care of the people that are involved, always. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's important to be able to relay that. And we've talked about Session Zero a lot, but at Session Zero even, you know, I always try to make a point of saying, please tell me if I overstep, if something's wrong, if you feel mm -hmm. upset if you don't want to stop the game because you don't want to feel like you're calling you know somebody out message me you know i have my phone on me i'll get your message we'll pause and then we will figure it out and let them know that retcons are always an option if you know they're uncomfortable with something then take a step back rewrite it quickly and go forward because as you said Real life is more important. Yes, we all have our story in our head that we want to tell as GMs, but the story is not as important as the people we are with. Right. Well said. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I think making making that safe space that your players can feel comfortable about approaching you is really important because I know personally... <laughs> I have had to do that in the Mountain of Mystery game myself because I was getting too, too into being my character and I was really starting to feel the pain that she was feeling. Um, and I had to take a step back and ask Dustin, hey, can we not have something purposefully traumatic happen to her? Like if something happens because things get rolled that way, it is what it is, but not specific things. So I think being able to make a safe space for players is really important. And I did definitely agree with the, the Discord, the, the, the age of Discord, being able to like have those private chats and being like, hey, you good? <laughs> While the rest of the story is continuing, you know? That's awesome. Yeah, it, it's interesting because as I mentioned, the top was, um, you know, for decades, I was usually the DM. And then when I started playing online because of the pandemic, I was always a player, mostly because it's the most convenient. I have a lot of things going on. And as everybody here knows, being a DM is a huge load of work. And <laughs> so all, all of my instances were always in person. And um, again, different dynamics in that I basically had regular groups of people, players or people that I knew really well from work or something. And there's never anything too, <clears throat> too true dramatic. Uh, but in the one instance I did, I very politely just stopped the whole game. I just said, "Hey guys, we're gonna we're gonna call it today. Um, you know, let's let's go get some dinner. Let's uh, whatever." Like, uh, but what's different is I see it now. I see it secondhand. You have so many people that you don't know that well that have ADHD and PTSD and all these other things that you don't know about them because you you just met them, right? Or you've only played two games with them before. And, uh, and so when I'm playing with people I'm familiar with, I can read them really well. And so usually you don't get surprised. Um, but when you're playing online with people that you're not in contact with as much, you might get surprised and go, oh, I didn't know about this, right? So uh, mm -hmm. it is, but man, like, uh, like um, uh, is it Nerdy T was the, what was your name, your real name? Tiffany. Hmm? Yeah, okay, it's Tiffany. So, because I, because we're talking like a personal thing, I'll call you Tiffany. 
is that I think you hit it right on the head, and I think everyone kind of said it, is that the people are what matter the most. If you, you know, screw the game. Let's, let's make this right, and let's move forward. And so, um, mm -hmm. in my case, we just stopped the game. It only happened once, and it, it was resolved. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, just player health first, the player mental health first. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And don't forget to check in on your players, too, like, after the game, mm -hmm. because... Uh, mm -hmm. If something really traumatic happens, you know, send them a message at the end and just say, hey, you good? You want to talk? You know, do you need to go over what happened? Are you OK with what happened? And sometimes the answer is no. And you really need to retcon something. Mm -hmm. Everybody so, needs aftercare. Yeah. Yeah. And I will, I will try to Agreed. find it. Um, one of my other DMs, actually, when we started her campaign, um, sent us all a specific D, D consent sheet that we all filled out I have and it that. includes yep. anything and everything Ooh. that could be considered traumatic things that we are okay with that are like uh oh, it's all right yeah that's put in and things that are like mm -hmm. absolutely none of this i don't sure. want that that way she could kind of judge where she wanted the story to go based on our responses before the game even started I have, yeah, I have that. that. I have that sheet. Please. It's an editable PDF. It's got extra lines for you to put extra things in there if there's something that's not mm -hmm. covered. It's fantastic. I since I found it, I use it in every game. Perfect. Could you post that in uh, in Tannis's Discord, please? Uh, I think I already have. I think that Tannis mm -hmm. has it, but I will put it in there again. So yeah, if anybody wants that who's watching, mm -hmm. it'll be over. Um, we'll put the socials in so you can get access to that. But it's a really good resource to have, even if you're playing just a one shot, just to know where everybody's sitting. Because some people like body horror, some people do not. So it's nice mm -hmm. to know, you know, any of those kind of, you know, extremes. And I'm talking about session zero. That's that necessary for session well. zero. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've had any. I don't think I've had anybody have like a, like fully like a trauma response to anything, but uh, I feel like definitely the avoiding or suppressing the impulse to to try because when you're in the moment of the story, there is that impulse to continue the story and to deal with things in the story, and resisting that impulse to deal with a uh, out of story problem with an in story solution. And it goes back to that idea of stopping the game. You're not yeah. like if this if the person is responding in this way, we're not going to fix it in story with the character. We're going to stop and deal on the the upper level. All right, awesome. All right, let's see. Probably have time for one more question. Um, let's see here. Um, we'll end, we'll end on a, on a, a lively note then, <laughs> um, name a time your players totally threw you for a loop or a funny moment in your campaigns. Ooh. Okay. This one's kind of related to a previous question as well. <laughs> okay. Um, so I had had my players walking through a space where there was nothing just just no life. And they'd been doing it for most of the session. So, you know, like a good three, four hours. And I'm a big fan of atmosphere. So I had dimmed lights. I had music going on in the background. I had just, and the players are starting to get this kind of like, even it's bleeding into how they're starting to respond to things in real life is they're starting to feel like maybe something's watching them. And so one of them decides to make a spot check, pulls out a spyglass, starts looking around. And I say, well, okay, you see an emaciated figure off in the distance. And she turns, points her spyglass at this thing, and it turns around. And I des describe it just turning around and staring, right, meeting her eye to eye. You know, these Ooh. things are just hundreds of yards away, um, staring at her right through the spyglass right back. And just viscerally at the table, stands up, starts screaming. It was like a three HP ghoul. <laughs> so. <laughs> Beautiful. But after the fight, they're like, I thought that was going to be. No, it was, it was just a ghoul. Yeah. Well done. It's fun. Man. That's okay. Great. Oh, no, Tiff, will, 
Tiff will understand the pain of this. I DM for middle school teenagers. So they are just, they are just chaos gremlins. Like mm -hmm. I, my, the biggest lesson I learned from them is not to over plan. Cause I went into that first session having like pages of document of planning. And after that session, I was like, I'm going to come up with a scenario and a second scenario and whatever happens happen. Dude, that's my entire Apocalypse World campaign in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm a big fan now of just doing milestones that I'd like them to hit, and even if they don't hit them, whatever. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll be honest, in terms of funny tales or think times that we've surprised, or that I've been surprised, I'll, I know that this is... The, the the DM's corner, everyone hears the DM. I'm going to have to take a tale from someone else's campaign that I was a player in, honestly. Mm. Um, Shadowrun campaign that me and... Uh, oh, shit, yeah. ...were part of for a long time. Long um, time. We, uh, for those who don't know Shadowrun, you're playing as criminals for hire in a uh, cyberpunk world with magic. A uh, mm. lot of a lot of corporate espionage, a uh, lot of mercenary work, stuff like that. A uh, Johnny mnemonic. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. We we got hired With as a team to steal something from another company, and we decided to actually do something that we don't usually do, which is you know do do some of the mission before we get there. Uh, do some prep work. Mm. Um. We decided to set up a distraction so that we could break into the facility. And we did that by say by putting out on the internet a message. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. A message saying, hey, there's gonna be a hit at this company. If anyone wants some free loot, sure some stuff to stop by. Um, well, the guy in charge of putting that message out there rolled a little bit too well. And when we showed up at the facility, finally, every single shadow runner in the city had shown up. It had devolved into a, into an actual war on the streets between this com <laughs> between this militant company and all of the shadow runners. There were dragons screaming across the sky. The everything is on fire. We all look at each other. We're like, um, I think we could just walk in at this point. Um, <laughs> it goes so well that we managed to go in there. We grab the thing. We leave. There's basically no problems at all. Um, however, post session, our game master did tell us that, uh, the company in question did find out that it was our fault that that happened, and now so and now we're on the run and have to leave the city. That's brilliant. <laughs> Kudos to the DM for giving you guys a crit on your <laughs> and then also looking in the game. yeah. So crit ish for those. <laughs> this is the one thing that makes this brilliant. Shadow Run is not a D twenty system. It is not a D10 a... system. It is a pools of D6 system where uh, a five or a six is a success. The person that was rolling to put out that message rolled something like 30 D6 and got 20 to 25 successes. Oh, oh wow. Wait, Wonderful. was that? I think that was me. Yeah, it was you, <laughs> Ping. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, that was me. Mm. I'm the, the Google gnome. I'm the, I'm, I'm the, 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 who, the, Google, the Google gnome, Chrome gnome, all, also yeah. as a Chrome gnome. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, my favorite story. I will replay this ping again. Please. I was going to say my favorite uh, story of something that surprised me, but also going back to the conversation I had with Unit about having plans of players do certain things. Um, was that i'll make again trying to make the long story short is they're going through a dungeon and it was this, just a series of trials uh what by that i mean you know fight this thing or find your way through this thing or deal with this trap but they're trying to progress just to get the hell out everyone was like levels two or three so pretty low and keep in mind again this is first edition so they're probably even less power than you might think they might be and uh, in this one section 
there they came into the chamber there's a sleeping black dragon on top of a pile of treasure no way do they want to wake that thing up and they have to maneuver around to go from room to room that, that intersects with that in a series of steps each time is like a you know they could potentially wake the dragon if they're not careful um but if they do things right should be a problem so one thing i love to do is play with new players because they always do the most chaotic thing and so <laughs> one of my friends at work she was playing a um a halfling thief and she goes i'm gonna go over to the treasure is there and the person's like what are you doing you know like we can get the hell out of here and so uh she said do you see anything see pretty nice necklace and she says, I'm going to try and get it, right? And I was like, what? So this goes to the part about having to plan. I had seven, uh, seven uh, index cards. Um, they didn't know what was in it, but there was five that said, dragon keeps sleeping. Uh, I think two that says, dragon stirs. One says, dragon awake, right? And so I said, pick a card. And they're like, no, 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 let's pick a card. Dra it says, dragon sleeping. They're like, oh, God, okay, fine. They go back, they're doing their thing. A couple minutes later, my friend, the halfling, says, is there anything else? <laughs> and they can't really stop because the players, the characters are separate from them, so they just talk to the player. And I say, you see a really nice ring. It's glowing. Okay, so she grabs that, pulls up, dragon wakes up. So again, first edition in a matter of like two rounds, uh, one guy's dead, another guy's, you know, acid spray and all that. It's just chaos. And the halfling, the player, she's like going, oh my God, because she's not played like this before, right? And she says, well, what does the ring do, right? So I, I pick up the Dungeon Master's Guide. I hold, I show, hold it up, and I point. I said, let me know when you want to use it. Her turn comes around. Everyone's freaking out. Uh, and I say, what do you do? She goes, I put on the ring, and I say, I wish I never took the ring. It was a ring of one wish, limited wish. Oh, and so, wow. so she it was all a dream. Yeah, it's all a dream again, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it was great because we were able to do the combination of completely chaotic dangerous thing that ultimately led to um everything being okay so that's i, I love telling that story because everyone's like oh my mm. god it's like totally you guys all get it you see how this confluence of things can happen so that, that was my favorite mm. no. oh man i love it um i think we all have a story of where the players like run through your encounter a lot faster than you were expecting so i'll always skip that mm -hmm. um, i have two very quickly, uh, I have a campaign that is uh, a very sandbox um, kind of style. I designed the entire world and pantheon and everything. And long story short, the mountain, the main mountain that takes up a lot of the map is not what it seems to be. And mm. my players were giving hints that things were happening. And I was like, oh, they're just going to get like little details here and there. And they're going to uh, figure it out eventually down the road. My brand new player, never played D&D &D before. I was so proud and pissed at her. She's a bard. She was like, huh, so that mountain's kind of important. I'm going to cast legend lore on that mountain. <laughs> Are you kidding? God. Legend lore is they know everything about that mountain. And I think I went pale in the face and i was like uh i'm gonna need a minute because i have to somehow go figure out how you know thousands of years worth of history for this thing. <laughs> oh my God. i'm like no nope. monologue for like half an hour maybe not that long like 10 minutes but still mm -hmm. i was just telling them everything that i thought they'd get you know bits and pieces of no matter now, did you have all this information? You had to make it all up. You had to make it all up, you said, right? I had 90% of it. But mm. after I started talking, that's when I saw, I found all the plot holes that I had made. And I had to, like, mm. rewrite parts of it. Oh, it's my like, gosh. Like, yeah. I thought, but... So that physically mm -hmm. hurt. I think I ran to the bathroom for, like, 10 minutes to just panic. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or but, you say, I got to go to the bathroom, and then you just leave. Yeah. <laughs> but the one time the players actually made me stop the session. We were half an hour away from the end anyway, but uh, they were investigating this manor. It used to belong to a noble family, but they up and left randomly a few years ago, and now they think there's a thieves' guild using it as a base. 
so they want to investigate. One of the players has a cat familiar, and he said, I'm going to send my cat in first to look around um, this window that we're out of. Okay, cool. The other players all pitch in and realize they have access to the find familiar spell. Every single one of them, all six players. And they have all decided that they're going to change their familiars into cat forms and throw them in. I have this entire manor planned out, all the encounters, everything, for people. Not for what cats are going to see. And I'm staring at the <sighs> face like, you're really doing this? You're really doing this? And they're like, yeah, pussy heist. Oh. <laughs> and I that, said, that, that sounds like a catastrophe. I was just going to say it was catastrophic. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> but, uh, that, I was like, I'm going to need a minute because there's some traps here that I don't know if cats are going to set off. And I, I left again to go, you know, playing and quiet. And they called back like, mm. you can just start here right. next time. I went, thank you. Like, why is, you don't have to like, worry about traps. They about feline agility. Yeah. And they're fey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we oh, did uh, it, the time that I the time I surprised a DM. Well, no, the time our entire party surprised a DM was we were play. It was the first campaign I ever played. It wasn't streamed. It was uh, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, and we were in uh, the Sunblight Fortress. We were going up against Zardarok Sunblight, and we had some insanely good charisma rolls and persuasion checks and deception checks with which we lured him up into the war room rather than going downstairs into a 25-room dungeon. So we were able to corner this mid-tier bed in a single room and skip an entire level dungeon that probably would have taken three, two or three sessions. Uh -huh. and, able to take, yeah. <laughs> and the DM was like, well, Bravo. I'll just throw out that entire map. Oh, man, that hurts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good kudos though kudos. yeah that's incredible i'm i'm trying to figure out you know what moment to talk about because i already mentioned that the, the campaign that i've been running there's just been constant moments of huh well i wasn't expecting that um <laughs> but <laughs> i i think i'm actually going to curb from one of the first campaigns that i played in um which was D, &D 3.5 and um, the way that our DM, uh, a homebrew thing that he did, was that um, for if you crit on a skill, you were able to add. I think I think the way that he did it was add ten to it or add twenty to it. Oh shoot! Um, I think, mm. it was, I think it, sorry. I think it was it was, it was add ten to the check. Mm. For, for critting on a skill check. Um, and we were getting to a place where like, I, I jumped in in this campaign and it was the campaign had been going on for years. So mm -hmm. like I jumped in, in the 3.5 campaign and I'm playing a uh, dagger spell mage. It's like, I don't know, I think starting off at like level 15 or something crazy like that, um, the campaign did get to epic level mm -hmm. at one point, um, which was so much fun. But, um, <laughs> It's a two-parter. I'll see how much of that I can easily squeeze in. So, the camp, uh, the, the player, the uh, the rest of the party, has is like is has to go down uh, into this uh, into this portal into hell in order to deal with some shit that's happening down there. Mm -hmm. And me being the wizard that I am, I'm looking at this going, "That's interesting." Wait a second. After a successful check. That's not a portal to hell. That's a portal to the abyss. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fuck. I need to go in and warn my friends about this because this is awful. Like, I'm the one standing outside as everyone mm. else has gone in um, to like stand guard and make sure everything's okay. I'm like, oh shit, I got to go in and tell them. So I go in, portal closes. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> so I, I, I managed to get down to them and I tell them what's going on. I was like, oh, can we get back out? I, I, shit. Um, <laughs> no, so we have to climb our way 
up through the abyss. We have uh, our, our bard does a successful mass disguise for a while. Um, mm. And uh, I think um, at either this, um, so, and, and because of all of this, our party has to makes a deal with a makes a deal with a devil, and of course our, our holy liberator, which is a chaotic neutral paladin, uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, um, the prestige class, was really not happy about that. And afterwards, like uh, bat, <laughs> we come out, and I'm like, listen, I'm um, sorry, and. Uh, <laughs> And this this devil, this arch, this arch fiend, um, had sent a representative to like watch over to make sure that this deal was going to go through and that everything's going to be okay. And our DM starts, you know, the name is Car and short for. And then the Holy Liberator looks at me as this is happening and just backhands me in the face mm. <laughs> to be like, "You made me do a deal with the devil." <laughs> like extremely pissed off at me. Um, mm -hmm. and, but, so, but the other story that was also um, the reason why I mentioned the, the the skill check is because we were having I think it was part of this or a different area um, we're gonna we have to deal with like a uh, uh, I think it was like a half devil half angel hybrid of sorts um, mm -hmm. and um, our our bard is like okay. I'm going to swift cast glibness um, has like a plus 38 normally on their bluff check because again, we're epic level at this point. And mm. then he crits and rolls a freaking 98 on a bluff check. Ooh. And so, <laughs> yeah. And so as a result, bluffs his bluffs his way out of three encounters, I think. Mm. Um, and our DM afterwards was like, you don't understand that and that angel, they had a name. Do you know what that means? They had a name. Oh no. <laughs> that is brilliant. I freaking love it. It was bonkers. Amazing. Mm. Uh, awesome. I, I will always remember that. That's fantastic. What what amazing stories and adventures. Um, does anybody else have any last quick things before we wrap things up here tonight? If anybody like to, in chat is I, thinking I, about being a DM, do it. <laughs> yep. I have, yep. I have two things. One is first, our host was amazing. So thank you. Yeah, thank yes, you. Thank you. Like, thank you. Keeping thank us you. on track. Mm -hmm. You're wonderful. I try. And, and <laughs> secondly, I'll, I'll say something that I love about D&D. &D, as we know, there's so many things to love about it, or TTRPGs, is that, yeah. um, as most of you probably know, when something really traumatic happens or something really wonderful happens, there's chemicals in your brain that kind of, in a way, kind of put an imprint so you remember it more clearly you remember oh i remember where i was when something happened whether it be the first time that i walked into disneyland right just have to be traumatic things and that's so mm -hmm. much what you get from DD, &D, and it shows how powerful it is mm -hmm. because i can remember stuff from when i was like 12 years old of a certain dice roll and then where i was sitting in the room when a certain thing happened mm -hmm. how are you going to remember that i don't remember playing monopoly when i was 12 years old in a detail right it's such well, an amazing no. game and it's shared memories. It's not just your own. Yeah. The guy with you in that amazing moment also remembers it and you talk about it. So I just want to mention that's one of the things I just love about the game is that it's just shared memories that you can talk about for years. And Absolutely. you know, it was almost always good because it's just pretend, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll actually go one step farther. I'll go I'll go one step further on that and say that not only can it uh, foster a lot of shared beautiful memories, it can also be incredibly healing. Um, mm -hmm. I have used, uh, so yeah. I should say, um, first and foremost, one of the reasons why I call myself Jubaka, uh, not only am I a hairy Jew, um, I'm actually a professional Jew. Um, I am clergy. 
So mm. I have done I have done marriage counseling before, and a couple that I know, in fact, um, so Ava was mentioning that for their fun funny fun story, this uh, this D this uh, GM that we both that we shared, um, she and her partner are going to be getting married soon. And they came to me for for marriage counseling, and they said, "Hey, can you just, why not? Can you can you do a game?" And I was like, "Hell!" Mm. That's how I learned about thirsty sword lesbians, um, which is <laughs> um, focused so much on relationships. Um, and uh, so they were like, um, the, one of them was able to to um, relive or or really like uh, have um, because uh, they're they're trans and. Um, so had we were able to i was able to create with them this story of of transitioning as a beautiful and powerful thing to do that was able to tap into their to so much of themselves that they didn't even know that they had that they would have vanquished the foe um and uh, after at the end of that part of you know the end of that session through that debrief she was crying um by because um, so much of it was 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 thinking about the the toxic masculine environment that she was raised in, um, and so uh, being able to use TTRPGs as a way to to we, we talked about you know how do we act when when someone has a traumatic experience. There's a good reason why we have to think about that because a lot of these stories that we tell together are stories about ourselves. Um, and so it can be such a great place mm -hmm. to process powerful uh, uh, traumatic experiences um, or, or even just stuff that we wish we could change about Absolutely. what happened when we were growing up. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I strongly encourage, I mean, Nerdy already put it, put it succinctly, <laughs> want to be a DM, go and do it. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I, I feel blessed that I could you know, be a part of that with these people. Huh. Wonderful. Yes. 100%. Absolutely. Well, thank That's you, everybody. Ended, this, <laughs> this is just fantastic. Yeah. Um, before we before we close for the night, um, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you when you're not talking about D&D &D on Twitch? Go down the initiative order again, Nimway, since you used that once. Who's first? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm on OnlyFans, and that's still a joke. Um, <laughs> I am mostly, I am mostly on TikTok. I am now Captivation, uh, but still Cap. Um, we'll see if that sticks. I have to stick with that for at least another like 27 days, so we'll see if that sticks. <laughs> but I'm mostly on TikTok. Sure. Uh, Eric. Yeah, so you can find me at uh, Dad Jokes and Dragons. Uh, this is the most Tiffany's ever seen me be serious. <laughs> she recognize me now. Uh, and uh, so at Dad Jokes and Dragons, my daughter and I, we uh, do cosplay and do fantasy related puns. Um, and then also every Monday night at 6 p.m. PST, uh, I, I'm on Gen Con TV. We have a D&D live play uh, called Dress to Quest where we dress up. Um, this is my current character, um, <laughs> Snark the Goblin. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, I oh, sucked yeah. suck on my head. Um, and so it's a fun little show. Um, we lots of shenanigans. Um, and that's about it. Awesome. Uh, JB? So uh, I haven't been streaming that much because currently I'm in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I am in Botswana, but I'll be moving back to the States at the end of the month. Um, so I, you might catch me streaming sometimes. I'm also the father of a, of a six month old daughter. Um, so Eric, what you're talking about, that's inspiration because I want to be doing when she's a, when she's a, a very much youngster, I want our, um, bedtime stories to be dice stories, um, for, uh, to, to, to get her started young. Uh, but when I do stream on Twitch, you can find me at uh, twitch.tv, GFG Jubaka. If you want to know more about what GFG means, it's a Discord server, and I can tell you all about it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's see who we have next. We've got Nerdy. Ah, okay. Uh, well, I'm on TikTok as Nerdy Teacher. 
I've, I've been kind of quiet lately just because I'm so tired, but hey, summer's coming, so I'll have plenty of time. Uh, I'm also in the uh, Mountain of Mystery uh, game that will play tomorrow. I won't be there, but I'll be watching. It'll be awesome. And uh, I'm also going to be a guest at Momocon at the end of May. Um, if you're in the Atlanta area and you can come, come say hi. Awesome. I thought you were talking about a different Momocon for a second. I got really excited. <laughs> Avatar. We're going to have to no, talk, apparently. There's a Momocon in Ohio as well. Uh, Interesting. Uh, Laura? Um, you can find me most places that I'm at as Laura Moth. Um, just started a uh, Twitter last night, but I am primarily TikTok. Um, where I do mostly discussions uh, or, uh, you know, going into the lore of various fantasy and sci-fi worlds. Um, but I also do extensively uh, discussions of the TTRPG that I'm building, uh, Fantasy Western, which is currently going under the name Vagabond Sun. Um, so Ooh. feel free to join me. It's, it's, we've been having a lot of fun there. I love the name. Thank you. That's a great name. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Eva? Um, so I've got a couple things going on. Uh, you can find me most reliably uh, in the No Panic server, the No Panic Button server. I'm one of their, his community managers at the moment. Um, uh, you can, hopefully, I will be running some one-shots soon, but more importantly than that, I am starting up doing some audio narration of sci-fi and horror stories and stuff like that. And oh. so you should be able to find me on YouTube as soon as I start actually posting. Got some recordings <laughs> in the work, just waiting You're for the You're the perfect edits. voice for that. Oh, thank mm. you. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Uh, you can find that. Uh, well, my my handle there is the same as my handle everywhere. Ava Unit Three. Nice. I'm glad awesome. I didn't go first because when you said where can they find us, I was going to give you guys my address. So, <laughs> you <laughs> can if you want to. I mean. <laughs> and you can find me uh, primarily on TikTok um, under Nimue of Avalon. Um, I also hang out a lot, obviously, in Tannis' Discord. Um, but yeah, I, our game plays tomorrow. I also will not be uh, in that session, um, as we have split the party. Uh, but yeah, you should definitely uh... definitely check it out. Um, that game tomorrow night will be here at uh, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, yeah, and the next, uh, next roll to cake. April 10th, yep, at 8 p.m. as well, Central Standard Time. And we will be posting um, regularly on the Crips and Cryptids TikTok page, as well as Instagram, uh, about all of the upcoming upcoming games. Um, so definitely keep an eye out there for the Roll for Cake and Mountain of Mystery campaigns. Sweet. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate you taking the time to hang out and talk D&D &D and have some laughs. Thank you. And thank you everybody in chat for hanging out and asking questions. And uh, we'll, you know, we'll keep the ones that we didn't get to uh, answer tonight for the next DM Talk Show. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, friends. Bye. <laughs>